Are all the uh, boards that are in quorum, have they been called to order or do they want to do something else? Board of Selected to order. Call the school committee to order. Okay. And libraries now? Okay. Um, okay. Um, I want to thank everybody for coming to tonight's financial forum. As most of you are well aware, the town's budget is under considerable pressure. Um, I've been a member of the Finance Committee since 2004, so this will be my fifth budget season. When I started in 2014, from the discussions at the meetings, I was immediately made aware that there was a structural issue within the budget caused by the combination of factors, but mostly because of the res revenue constraints under Proposition 2.5, and, and along with cuts in state aid. On the expense side, health care costs and benefits were increasing faster than revenue. Within education, the cost of mandated special education is growing, constraining resources with a significant impact on the school budget. Since I joined, budget meetings have always been about where to cut and what cuts can be made and have the least impact on services that the town provides. We're well past that now. The cuts we're making are creating risks. Everywhere the town needs funding. Population growth, the opioid crisis, and aging population are impacting the resources of the police, fire, and emergency services. The school system is being forced to reduce important areas of the children's educational experience. Staff shortages are creating operational risk in town offices. Being understaffed can cause control issues and puts many functions at the town under pressure. As a member of the Finance Committee, I've been impressed by the town staff and the planning that goes into the budget process. Right now, the town budget is um, in a passable shape, but um, and the town has a comfortable free cash position. It's not excessive, but it provides enough of a cushion that the town budget can handle a few hits. It's strong enough that we were comfortable using 1.2 million of the free cash to support this year's operating budget. There can be no assurances that the free cash will continue to generate and be able to use, be used to support the operating budget. The capital budget was in good enough shape that we were able to free up some cash in the past couple of years to help out the operating budget. With a failed override last year, the select board is fully expecting to go back to the voters again with a reduced override request. What the selectmen decide, however, will not solve the budget problem. It will most likely be a patch that will allow the town to restore what will otherwise be cut from this year's budget, some of the cuts from last year's budgets, and a little more um, funding available for public safety and a few other things. The schools will be able to reconstruct the budget after many years of cuts, which will hopefully move the budget cost curve down to a more sustainable level. I'm optimistic that budget pressure will be reduced in future years, but we'll need new growth and some luck to not have to come back and ask for more in a few years. There is a little cushion in the existing budget. At tonight's meeting, you will receive an overview of the budget structure and process, a calendar of the future budget meetings, an overview of the town's free cash position, a summary of the school committee voted budget and restoration and reconstruction budget, and the town manager's budget and the budget restoration priorities, and then we'll have some time for questions and answers. Um, I think with that, I'll uh, hand it over to Bob. Um, thank you. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Yeah. How about at home? <laughs> <laughs> Um, I thought it would be helpful since um, I've received actually quite a number of comments and questions this year uh, that have been unlike other years. Um, so I recognize there are some people that are involved in the budget process that haven't been um, necessarily as, as involved in the past. I, I did the math and I think this is my 21st budget, both as a volunteer and as an employee. So um, it is old hat to me and I feel like I really need to stop and explain some things. <coughs> I'll start by describing kind of what the budget looks like, and then I'm going to get into some important reasons why the process is the way it is. Next year, we are looking at uh, just over $95 million of revenue in the general fund. Uh, just to be clear, there is a water and sewer, uh, there is water, sewer, and stormwater enterprise funds, and there is the general fund. The general fund is where we are here to discuss that's constrained by revenues. 72% of those uh, revenues are property taxes, and that includes about $3 million for the high school and the library uh, excluded debt. 15% is state aid, 8% other local revenues over which we have some control, 
And then there's a couple of smaller issues, including, um, as Peter mentioned, the small amount of free cash being used. So we start with the revenues. And then we subtra subtract a set of annual costs called accommodated because they're paid for first under a budget model we've been using for 15 years. And I am going to circle back and explain why. But first, this is what they look like. They're $36 million. Almost half of them are employee and retiree benefits. There's capital and debt. There's out of district special ed. And you can see a couple of other things, energy costs, rubbish, snow, um, some uh, insurance and veterans assistance. And if you simply take the revenues, less these accommodated costs, you're left with just under $60 million to fund the town and the school operating budgets. So that is a framework we've developed, and I'm going to explain why, uh, but it's worked very well over the last 15 years. That $59.5 million is split 36-64%, uh, 36% for the towns. So that is the operating budget. Um, that happens to be a 2.5% increase over last year. Uh, last year at this time, it was around a 1.25% increase, so we're actually in slightly better shape this year. The 36-64 uh, ratio historically was two-thirds, one-third, closer to that. But when the facilities department moved largely under the town, those numbers changed slightly. <clears throat> is that split set in stone? Uh, the answer is no. <clears throat> However, the things we do to change it don't change it very much. There's a process called a community priority. Uh, both the schools and the town have used it in the past not that frequently. Um, two that came right to mind were some funding for social emotional learning in the schools. And then I don't remember if it was the same year or one year different, funding for the uh, school resource yeah. officer. So that's, these are things that neither the town nor the school believe they can fund all by themselves. And they're looking for a partner the other side of the house to share those costs. <coughs> Uh, in those first years, we add them into the budgets as a as a uh, accommodated cost. Once they get into the baseline operating budget, they then you know absorb the typical 64-36 split, and off we go. Um, this is probably the most important slide I'll I'll show tonight why it's important. Uh, prior to this model, annual budgets were built by setting aside funds for shared costs, such as benefits and debt. Those were obligations that could not be avoided. And then we argued about allocating the rest. I had put food fight in there, and I thought I wouldn't actually put that in writing. Uh, but it pretty much was. Uh, and not surprisingly, capital received almost no attention at all. If there was any money left over that nobody else wanted, we could fund some capital. I distinctly remember one year just prior to the last successful override, spending less than $100,000. Um, now we spend in the millions. Um, probably the most important section of this slide is the next one. The unintended consequences of that process were there was competition for resources instead of collaboration, both between the town and the schools and within town budgets and within school budgets. Um, I remember as a FinCom, um, liaison to the schools under Dr. Hartunian, uh, being horrified that I saw regular day ed and special ed parents almost killing each other in the room, arguing for resources. There was also an emphasis on spending as proving the reason you needed funding. So if you could keep, the more you could spend, the more you would get. And because we'd never funded capital at, a, at an appropriate level, we suffered increasing maintenance costs, both in facilities and especially in DPW with equipment. Um, the current model that I've described encourages collaboration, which is really very strong. It encourages planning, which is the only reason that we have lasted as long as we have since the last override. And it encourages efficiency. Um, a, an area that spends less money is not penalized in the next year by getting less money just because they did a good job. So I think, I think the budget model is very important. <coughs> it's perhaps easier to understand, but I think the background is important for you all to understand if you're new to this, that it's been well thought out over, over almost two decades, and there is, there is a reason for it. Just to show some recent results, and these are at the time town meeting passed budgets, so things happen during the year that changes them. So in FY19, we are looking at 3% revenue growth, 6% accommodated costs, and therefore 2.5% operating budgets. 
Um, Peter referenced sort of the, the annual squeeze, and that's what this is. Accommodated costs are generally forecast to grow more than revenues. Um, the t there's two reasons for that, primarily. One is that state aid as a revenue lags. Uh, today we were just advised of what the governor's uh, state aid figure was, and it's, it's not even 2.5%. Um, if, if state aid would have grown at 2.5%, we wouldn't need an override. It's a shocking statement, but over the last 15 years, that's true. Um, our accommodated costs are forecast at six. The biggest wild card, is, as you'll see as you watch the process, is health insurance. Um, from some recent numbers, I believe we may have some slightly better news on that, uh, but long term, it's really difficult to forecast anything very low on health insurance. You can see in some years, uh, particularly FY17, the uh, accommodated costs were very well behaved. Um, there are things that both the school and the town work very hard to contain, and it's to our benefit to do that because the less money we spend on accommodated costs, the more we have for the operating budget. So that's a really powerful incentive for us all to work collaboratively on that set of costs. And again, you can see last year was particularly difficult. Um, we had to, if you will, wean ourselves off. We had used over two million of free cash in FY17. Then an override failed, and we had to go back down to a sustainable amount of free cash. So that was a very tough hit to the revenues, and caused the operating budgets, um, you know, quite a lot of pain. In terms of the annual process and the meeting schedule, we have one or two, typically one, fall financial forums. Uh, we examine revenues and accommodated costs forecasts. The revenue forecasts are usually very accurate. The accommodated cost forecasts uh, usually get a little bit of tweaking during the winter, but are generally not too bad. Um, from that uh, revenue and accommodated cost forecast, as you can see, we know what money will be left for the operating budget. FinCom's role is to, is to decide on how much free cash should be used to supplement revenues, which then flow right to the uh, operating budgets. And therefore, there is guidance for the operating budgets once that meeting is done. Um, I'm fairly sure that this year's financial forum uh, left us with a 2.4% forecast for operating budgets. We're a little better, and I'll show you why. Uh, typically in January this year, the town uh, did it in December, the elected boards review the town and the school budgets. Uh, as a matter of semantics, the selectmen advise the town manager, but the school committee actually votes a final budget, and that's state law. In February, this year in January, um, the town manager must balance the final budget for both the town and the schools based on the revenues available, the forecast accommodated cost, and what is left. Um, locally, we cannot pass an unbalanced budget. Um, I often wonder how federally and in this, the state has to pass a balanced budget. But they can be a lot more creative than us. But I often wonder how much fun this job would be if we could just pass an unbalanced budget all the time. Uh, we can't. Typically in March, this year in February, the Finance Committee then has several meetings to go over the school budget and the town budget and all the other budgets that are shared, such as debt, benefits, and capital. They then vote a final balanced budget, as I have had to do. The Finance Committee's budget goes to town meeting in April, late April, and town meeting, town meeting makes the final decision. They can change virtually anything other than the revenue forecast. So any, any way to spend money is up to town meeting. For those that uh, have been involved in the process this year, I just want to give an update of what has happened since the last financial forum in the fall. The revenues are up a little over 250000 uh, That night, the Finance Co Committee agreed to use $1.2 million in free cash, which is 100000 more than we had entered the evening assuming. We have also seen $100,000 growth in property taxes since then, um, half of its new growth, half of its underlying. An additional 50000 in excise taxes. Uh, in addition to folks buying new cars, there's a lot more people in town, so there's a lot more cars in town. And then a modest amount of enterprise fund support. Um, needless to say, we've spent all that money. We spent 75000 to add to the out of district special ed budget because they saw some increased costs, and I understand that may or may not be enough. We spent an additional $50,000 of capital 
Um, for the last four years, the Finance Committee has a policy of spending 5% on debt and capital to protect our infrastructure. But for the last four years, they have agreed to relax that because the budgets are in such tough shape. Um, this increase in capital still leaves us $130,000 below um, the 5% FinCom policy, and again, for the fourth year in a row. It's not horrible, it's not, it's not a good idea, it's not sustainable. Um, we have a little bit higher enrollment in the vocational schools. We saved a little money in energy. And about half of these increased revenues were directed towards the town and school operating budgets, therefore the increase from 2.4 to 2.5 percent. I'm going to turn it over now to the town accountant, Sharon Angstrom. Thank you, Bob. So what you see here is our current reserve position for the general fund. Um, there are three components of that reserve, which is the free cash, which is certified by DOR, um, the general fund um, stabilization fund, and the FinCom reserves. We have just about $10.3 million in reserves, which represents about 10.9% of our estimated revenues for fiscal 19. FinCom has a 7% minimum reserve policy, so we are comfortably above that. Um, and it's, it's, it's interesting because people see that free cash and they think, free cash, why are we not using that? Reserves are very, very important, just like in your household finance, you need to have that rainy day fund. And bond rating agencies really want to see that range to be above 10%. And we do enjoy a lovely AAA bond rating because we maintain it. Um, so it is important to know that chipping big dollars away from that free cash can jeopardize that, that bond rating and make us look not as financially strong. This is a um, free cash growth chart. It shows you kind of where we've been since 2006 and projected out to 2020. You'll notice that in fiscal 16, we peaked on our free cash at just over $9.2 <coughs> million. And then in fiscal 17, it declined about a little over 60, 650000 And the projections for 18, 19, and 20 were derived by um, assuming $1.2 million, which is what we're using in fiscal 19 and are using currently in fiscal 18 to support the operating budget. And then a conservative regeneration figure of $1 million. We have seen regeneration much higher than that, but we're always conservative when we're talking about regeneration. It's not guaranteed. Sometimes the regeneration comes from places that you really aren't expecting. So, so that's just a conservative look at kind of how it's grown over the years. And if things were exactly as I described for fiscal 18 through 20, it would consistently go down and we'd be chipping away at those reserves. Back to you, Bob. <laughs> Thanks, Sharon. Um, Dr. Doherty and I will very briefly now present our balanced budgets. By briefly, I mean two slides. Um, on the right-hand side, well, this, this chart here actually shows um, what was requested to provide level services. Um, you can see at the very bottom the change is in 8.2%. And remember I told you we had 2.5% to work with, so that was a little bit optimistic. One of the things the town has not publicly done a good job, uh, and it's been on purpose, is to describe the funding of public safety. Um, in order to be uh, a peer average staffed community, and I would argue we need to be more because of our, our geographic location, we are short nine uh, police officers and firefighters. Because we do such planning and we have such a good budget model that looks ahead very clearly, and because we don't have to argue for money and we know it won't, won't help, we never added those positions because we knew we couldn't sustain them. Maybe for one year we could have. We're not about to hire someone and then have to lay someone off in another year. So the, the nine positions in public safety are a pretty serious shortcoming. This budget adds those all back. The budget that's affordable, as you can see from the column third to the right called FY19, is a 2.5% increase. I thought it was important for this slide to show last year or the current year's uh, budget uh, because this year we uh, put some one-time funding in some areas such as facilities 
um, in order to not have to lay people off in this budget. So we did that consciously. We laid off or we eliminated, I believe it was seven and a half FTEs last year. We didn't need to do all that. We did it opportunistically. There was retirements, there was a turnover. So instead of filling positions and then losing them this year, we, we did it all a year ago. And you can see over the two year period, uh, town budgets are growing at 2%. And just to be clear, not to confuse anyone, but this is a combination of the operating budgets and the accommodated budgets on the town side all combined. So in order to um, balance the budget, the selectmen heard um, a more lengthy and earlier look at the budget process from all the department heads in December. I think they had learned a great deal from it. Um, it was a lot harder after that for me to cut the million and a half that I have to do every year because there was a lot more pressure on, well, no, you got to do this, you got to do this. Whereas normally we do that in the back room and don't tell anyone. Um, this year we opened it up to the public and showed the different kinds of risks we're taking, quite frankly, as a community by not funding it. Um, so the million and a half was cut. Uh, most of those cuts, as you can see, were in public safety because this budget does not propose hiring any of those new nine positions um, that I mentioned. Uh, now I'll turn it over to Dr. Doherty. Get that one. Yeah. Thank you, Bob. But before I talk a little bit about the um, balanced budget, I, I do want to echo a couple of things that, that Bob mentioned during the beginning of his presentation about the model. and. I think it's a combination of the model and the people and the relationships that all of us have working together. Um, this is my ninth budget. I don't have as many budgets <laughs> under my belt as you. Um, but I've seen firsthand the working relationship that Sharon, Bob, myself, and Gail have. And you extend that out to the other department heads, and including the facilities department. And I do think it's a combination of the model and the people of the relationships that really make this happen and it's why we've been able to do more with less over the last several years they what bob was talking about earlier this evening about the um the additional revenue that came in during the fall after the financial forum there was a lot of discussion that went back and forth on what was the best way to address both town and school budgets on how to use that additional revenue so um you know, there's a lot of a lot of good things happening behind the scenes with those relationships, and it's really the the people that make that happen. Um, oh, I always have problems with this thing. Okay, I can do it. Okay, so the. Oops. Huh? <laughs> I, I have problems too. <laughs> So this is a snapshot, um, very similar to what uh, Bob talked about. Um, so the accommodated costs in the school department budget is the special education, tuition, and transportation. And so you could see that that was the major driver um, in the increase. The non-accommodated costs, which is the rest of the, the budget and the the majority of the budget, that, that went up 2.2%, but it was the accommodated costs that went up 12.1%. And one factor that contributed to that this year, yes, there was an increase in the number of students that went out of district and a number of students that required more specialized transportation who are on individualized education plans. But we did also have uh, this year a $200,000 decrease in the circuit breaker, which is a state reimbursement that we receive um, for students that um, as a cost of the amount of services that they have over a certain amount we receive a percentage back from the state and that went down for all for all communities um, for, for this year uh, a certain percent and, and for us it was a two hundred thousand uh, dollar decrease so that we had to adjust that cost as well so the two the total budget is three point two percent you could see that the and so the the balance budget is forty two million seven hundred twenty three thousand twenty five dollars when we factored in our what the level service budget would be very similar to what Bob did um, it actually was a five point one percent increase and just for definition, a level service budget for us is really 
the same services and programs as we are doing currently in FY18 with projected increases for things like collective bargaining, cost of living adjustments, inflation, contractual, um, things that go up, but we have to, in order to keep everything the same and same programs and the same services, that would be a level service budget. So you could see that the deficit <coughs> between the balanced budget and the level service budget is a little under $800,000. So the challenge was um, reducing that amount. So you can see this is a breakdown by the cost center. We do have five cost centers in our in our school department budget. A lot of how we have to capture funding is dictated by the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education in terms of the line items that we use, in terms of the cost centers that we use, um, and we have to capture all that each year um, in an end of the year report, which is we, we have to uh, report to the state. So you can see that there are some increases and decreases across the cost centers. Uh, the, smaller, the smaller cost centers tends to be more fluctuation because there's a smaller amount of money. Um, the administration cost center, you can see there is an increase, but that's because it's actually a shifting of um, funding from one cost center and another because we did do some restructuring of funds uh, for an additional position. Special education, you can see um, there is the increase, and that is really due to the tuition and uh, transportation increase. Um, the, uh, the, the, the decrease that you see here is the regular day, and that is where the majority of our reductions had to uh, occur. Um, and we've seen that over the last five years, especially where our level service budgets have had to get decreased each year, and particularly over both next fiscal year, the current fiscal year, and last fiscal year, the, the reductions have had to come into the classroom. Uh, we, I believe the number is 20.5 teaching positions if you include next year um, over, the, over the last three years. Here are the reductions in the school committee balance budget. The school committee did vote um, this budget um, on Monday evening. Uh, there are the seven middle school teachers, which is a combination of English language arts and foreign language um, across grades six, seven, and eight. Uh, three elementary classroom teachers, uh, which, which will have an impact on class size. Um, the two regular education tutors, one was at the elementary, it's actually a, a decrease of hours for all of the tutor employees and then a, an elimination of a position at the middle school. Um, some of the non-personnel reductions include a reduction of uh, athletic events at each level, freshman varsity and junior varsity, a uh, combination of uh, equivalent of two games per um, sport. Uh, that's a savings of transportation and game officials fees. Virtual high school is an online um, online courses that our students at the high school can take. And then the cleaning services, um, this is optional vacation cleaning that is built into the contract. Um, and that's where the reduction is there. So you can see uh, it is a total of 12 FTE. Um, 10 of them are classroom teachers, and that, that's the reduction of the, um, from the level service budget that you saw earlier. I believe okay, that's, that's it. That's it. <clears throat> Peter? Um, okay, well, uh, I guess now we'll open it to questions. I um, don't know what uh, questions people might have, but... Uh, Peter? Oh. Well, do I need that? No, it's not going to reach. It's not going to reach. Is that just for the room? Yes. Yeah. Dan, can you hear me? Okay. Um, so thank you for laying it out. Just so I can clarify a couple things. Um, Dr. Doherty, you mentioned uh, cut to, you frame it in terms of a cut to level service, right? So that's the 785,000. You Correct. need 785,000 more next fiscal year to do the exact same things you're doing this year, right? That is correct. So budgets are going up, right? So on the town side, it's 2.5%. On the school side, it's 3.2%. But I find it helpful to look at it this way, right? 
it, it's actually a cut of 785,000 for the schools. And I seem to recall from the meetings either earlier this week or last week, Dr. Dory, I think you said it a few times, this is the fifth straight year of cuts mm -hmm. on the school side? That's correct. And I don't have it off the top of my head. I don't know if you do. This year it's 785,000. I forget exactly what it was last year, the year before, the year before. If you total up the cuts for the five years, do you know that number? It's about three and a half million dollars. Three and a half million dollars in cuts. So even though the budget's going up, it's actually a three and a half million dollar cut. Yes. Now, Bob, Bob, if I look at it on the town side, the 1.5 million you showed, the actual, the, the balanced budget versus the requested, is that the analogy on the town side? It's a million and a half of cuts to level service, is that right? Um, I'll start off by asking a question, uh, just for you all to think about. Uh, what is level service of public safety? And I, I answered it this year by saying it's, it's driven by population and what the ratio of is officers and firefighter EMS um, to the population of our peers. When, when I mentioned we are nine, nine underfunded, I should have added we are nine only in the last six years. Prior to that, we fell behind about another 12. Um, I don't think you need to be staffed as high as some peer communities are. Um, I think you, we do need to be staffed uh, to those nine. So if level services include those nine, it's a million and a half. But to be fair, we never added them. So it's not replicating the current service we have. So we're closer to 500,000. Take away the 800 odd thousand and change, five, 600,000. And that's been the same picture as the schools for the last four or five years. And I guess that's what I was driving at, if you had kind of a five-year number for that as well. Like yeah, that, um, yeah, two million ballpark to, to a, little, a little bit more without those additional staffing based on our population growth. That, that's kind of just what I wanted to highlight. You know, this year, taking into account what you just said, Bob, with the caveat on the 1.5, right, versus actual level service or where we should be on public safety. but. 734 in the school side, a million five in the town side, 2.1. But if you go back over five years, you know, that's five, six million dollars is what I've heard that we've cut. So even though dollars are going up, I think it's helpful to look at it in that way. Um, it, these are cuts year on year uh, to level service. Bob? Bob, can you reiterate what you were talking about with state aid and what we've seen over the last? I think it was a mic. Oh. Yeah, let's oh. use the mic. <laughs> I just wanted Bob to be able to reiterate what we've been seeing in state aid over the last 10 years and as a percentage of what that adds to our revenues, how that has shifted in the last 10 years. Um, sure, Paul. I don't have the figures in front of me, but I have a generally good memory. Um, since the last override, uh, state aid is the slowest grow growing component of our revenues. And remember, our property taxes are limited by 2.5% a year, and our expenses are going up faster. Um, the last few years, state aid has been around 1%. Uh, the figure that we got for the schools today was around 1.1 or 1.2%. Uh, the town side, if you will, and we mix it all together, it doesn't matter, it's a little higher than that. Uh, we're not going to be anywhere as close to even 2% this year. Um, the sort of thing I said earlier uh, that I've circulated to a number of people who have asked and we discussed it the last uh, override discussion, um, a, uh, a group, I don't remember their name, they're a, you know independent budget group, looked at the main components of state spending. I think there were five or six. Uh, let's say there were five, four of them in real terms adjusted for inflation over the last 15 years were negative. The only thing that was positive was health care and health related expenses. So for the government, it's not just state government, it's not just health insurance for their employees, it's the health insurance they offer to the residents. So it's a much bigger percent of their, their budget. That's the only thing that's gone up over the last 15 years and it's crowded out everything else. In real terms, the cut over 15 years to, to local aid was shocking. It was 49% less, so it's half. <coughs> um, 
you know, I, I did the math quite simply. Again, if we had had a 2.5% or 3% increase in state aid since the last override, we'd have another $5 million annually in our budget for revenues. That's a staggering thing. That alone explains why we're here if there would needed to be no other discussion and no other reason. Um, on the one hand, uh, for the last few years, the state has done the best they can. On the other hand, um, for several years before that, they did not do a particularly good job. But to be fair, their hands are very much tied by health insurance and health care related costs. They're doing the best they can. It's uh, Health insurance is a problem for all of us. Wait. I just had a Can you use the microphone, please? A hey, microphone? Um, I, I should turn the TV one, too. In terms of the um, budget cycle, one of the things that's come up a number of times, I think it was Mr. Berman clarified it um, a couple nights ago, is the time frame in which we're doing all this planning and what that lags in terms of when we actually execute the budget. So I'm wondering if you could just sort of review that. Sure. As you can see from just this page, um, both the schools and the town uh, sped things up this year in order to get a lot more information out to the community sooner. Um, and that has clearly happened. Um, by charter, I must give the Finance Committee a balanced budget on March 1st. I'm committed to doing that on February 1st this year. Uh, they have agreed to meet in the first two or two and a half weeks of February and finish. They're typically not done till the end of March. So there'll be a lot of definitive final information available uh, five to six weeks sooner for the community to think about as we go into both the elections and town meeting in April. Um, there is a risk of that. <clears throat> By giving the budget uh, one month sooner, I have less perfect information on some of the variables. Um, I will not know health insurance, and I don't believe we will know our health insurance number until after the Finance Committee has voted a budget. You know, sometimes there's good news, sometimes there's bad news. We will have no ability to adjust before Finance Committee, you know, creates a budget. State aid, typically we don't know the final number till sometime between June and August. Uh, this year, thankfully, the governor did come out with a number this weekend and is starting to disseminate it today. And we can see that it's going to be short of our estimates but I believe it'll be okay. Um, so the process is very much speeded up this year. I know it's been very difficult for the town. I'm sure it's been very difficult for the schools to compress it. Um, we've, we've probably done more meeting time up front than is typical. Um, we're hoping to speed through the Finance Committee in February with a little bit less time because they've seen so much already. Um, there's pluses and minuses to the process this year. I'm sure we'll talk about it uh, sometime in the summer when we, we've recovered. <laughs> Um, I, I think the public part is good. Um, it's, it's tough to have so many meetings. To have three meetings a, a week on budgets are not easy on anyone. Bob, um, I wanted to clarify one of the points you made about um, town meetings role and town meeting, meetings ability to um, allocate money in a different way than the way FinCom presents. Um, or recommends the budget to town meeting. Is that true except for when it comes to the schools? It, is, is it not true that um, the schools are al allocated a certain number, but then the schools can dis uh, allocate that money how the schools see fit um, within that that quantity? That, that town meeting is not going to be able to say, well, we'd prefer to see the middle school uh, teachers back is that right? Um, yeah, town, town meeting has the same ability I do. There is, I'll, I'll say, about 20 line items in the budget. There's only one line item, line item in the school department right. called schools. Right. So that total that Dr. Doherty mentioned is the only thing that I can change and the only thing town meeting can change. Only the school committee can determine how to spend the money that town meeting ultimately agrees to. Now, there can be a discussion on town meeting floor in which the school committee is asked point blank, would you do this if we did this? And then the school committee can answer it any way they wish. They have the ultimate authority and the right uh, to do that. Within the town budget, again, there are far more line items. Every department has a wage and an expense line. But technically, town meeting cannot tell the town manager how to spend the wages or the expenses within a department. 
um, my predecessor didn't always listen as carefully, and it was fine. <laughs> no one seemed to mind. As a practical matter, I, I think I'd pretty much go along, unless there were cuts made that I just knew were a horrible idea. Um, so town meeting has the right to limit the town more so than the schools, but they certainly cannot get down to the very specific line item or personnel position in most cases and have that much influence, you're right. Thank you. Um, also, also, to the extent that health care and um, state aid come in either over or under um, budget by a significant amount, that's one of the things that we would uh, typically use free cash to uh, to take care right. of, so it didn't impact the budgets as, as they existed, unless there's something really ridiculously large, but hopefully that won't happen. Since you mentioned free cash, if you could bring back up that slide with the um, projected, I guess it would help me um, with the bar chart of the different years. Uh, that one, it would help me if uh, the projected years were a different color than the actual certified years, so we can see where they, um, you know, it has been kind of trending up, and we see it coming down, but that's actually a projection of it coming down. Well, and 17 does go down. It does, yes. Yeah. Right. And then the, the last the rest years are, are projection, yeah. absolutely. Any other? Uh so David Corey, uh, Mount Vernon Street. I don't know if this is the right forum to ask the question, but uh, in some of the school budget meetings, of which, as you alluded, there were many, um, that Dr. Doherty, you presented some information about the, um, the level service growth rate year over year back about five or six years. Um, you know, so this year is, whatever it is, 5.2%, and you just had, you know, what the level of service growth projected was back about five years. Um, I'm wondering if there's similar information on the town side, and whether we have any information about, um, you know, our, our school expenses just going up faster than non-school expenses, and, um, you know, how does that compare to peer communities? Um, you know, do, we, do we have information from peer communities about the relative growth rates? And, and I don't even know if it's um, comparing apples to apples because different towns are organized differently and they have different levels of service and all that. But um, if, if this is the right forum, if you could comment on that. Just a lot of different questions all over the one big blob. So the our level service budget each year is is been somewhere I believe between three and a half four percent to five five point two which is this year the biggest driver for us has been special education over the last several years um, the tuition and the transportation um, obviously we're doing everything we can to to minimize those costs I mean we've seen. We've seen pockets of where the issues are, um, why those increases have been happening, and you know what we're finding is that they, we are we are seeing a, an uptick in students at the high school, primarily for social emotional reasons that we are um, have to go out for uh, out of district placements. Um, so that's something certainly we're trying to figure out how can we best create create programs in district that would um, be obviously beneficial for those students and minimize those costs. But that's where we're seeing our biggest challenge when it when it comes to the level service increases over the last five years. Um, my answer has got two parts. Two years ago, uh, when Dr. Doria and I sat down and discussed a possible override and, and a longer term financial projection and picture, um, we both agreed that if we had three and a half percent operating budgets, uh, it would be fantastic. <laughs> Nothing could be better. You can see in one year we almost did, but after you've been cutting for so long, it doesn't feel quite as good to just have one year like that. Um, so the town is very similar to the schools generally. In terms of the operating budget, I believe the schools do have more pressure in specifically in out of district special ed as an accommodated cost. Um, in the past, energy costs or rubbish collection actually has done that on the town side. It hasn't in the last few years, and of course now it will. 
Um, <laughs> so, you know, the school's answer of 5% is a combination of those two pieces. Uh, the town's answer right now is definitely lower because our accommodated cost piece has behaved well for the last several years. Um, but 3.5% is something I believe we'd be quite happy to live on if 3.5% always flowed to the bottom line there under operating costs. Hi, Michael DiGiorgio, uh, Curtis Street. Um, forgive me as I fumble through this. I'm trying to take notes and I'm all over the place. But I said 3.5% is an operating budget 3.5% would solve a lot of problems. And obviously, we can't do that because of the problems that you would have. The problems that you would have has passed in 1980. And put in effect in 1982, I believe. Probably half of us in the room have grown up with this infrastructure in place and all thought it over. What can the FinCom and I guess the selectmen do to perhaps override the Prop 2.5 and, and put into law from a charter perspective and writing charter that we're allowed to go 3.5? Um, you know, the going to the accommodated budget model, um, as you said, um, removed a lot of contention and a lot of um, fighting over money. It was a very divisive discussion. That's exactly what these overrides are. Every uh, last one is 15 years ago. And here we are. Last year we had one very divisive topic. We're going to go through it again, hopefully. Well. Hopefully we'll have the option to vote on the override. Is there something we can do that we can avoid having to ask for overrides every so often just to basically bump us back up to the par and then slide back down the hill, bump us back up the hill, and then slide down again? Um, and again, so I guess my question is, and you don't have to answer me this second, I guess it's more of if you could think on this, um, are there ways to increase the tax rate or we'll be able to get around the Prop 2 and a half rule. Um, obviously, the town would have to agree on that, um, is one thing. Or looking at charging a different tax rate based on the residents' use of facilities. So you could look at it as following that one-third, two-thirds model, where residents with children would pay a higher tax rate versus you say, people who don't have children. And again, that seems to be the line where a lot of contention is about the overhead. Um, I am painting with a broad brush here, but um, you know, these are just a couple of thoughts that I had, and I'd like, um, I'd like you guys to consider that as well. I can answer that quite simply, no. <laughs> yeah. um, Prop two and a half is a state law that no one has any authority to do anything about except to ask their local voters to override it. Period. There are other ways to raise revenue, but in terms of property taxes, that's it. Well, I, I, I respectfully disagree that, that the answer is definitively no. Um, I will tell you it is definitively no. The, you cannot charge, you can charge businesses and residential different tax rates, but you cannot collect more revenue from those different rates than the total would have otherwise been under Prop 2.5. Again, there are other revenues you can raise. You could, for instance, as the selectmen are doing now, try to encourage economic development and new growth, and that's new additions to the tax base which create new taxes. Sure. But the existing tax base must go up no more than 2.5% unless the voters in a community approve uh, an override. And I can tell you ways how Reading would be built better to live within 25 but it would involve uh, the town seizing uh, quite a good deal of single-family homes, knocking them down and turning them into commercial space. That's what most towns look like. We are very highly residential and we have a lot of school children to educate. So unfortunately, for a town modeled uh, under Prop 2 and a half, we're not built well. All right, could you then clarify something for me? With the override last year, and because I'm, I'm not 100% on, was there verbiage in the override that said we could increase the 
basically have the override increase apply to multiple years as opposed to the first year, which would essentially be a greater override, or greater than a two and a half percent year over year. Um, there's financial okay. techniques you can use to perhaps accomplish that, but you cannot legally pass a single override that says that. Last time there was a seven and a half million dollar override um, requested right away. If voters had approved it, there was the authority to town meeting of spending all seven and a half million right away. If town meeting chose to spend it over a longer period of time, they could effectively create an annual increase that's higher than two and a half percent. Let's say they saw the seven and a half million and said, we're only gonna spend five. Let's put two and a half million in the bank. And then next year they said, let's spend another half million and so on and so forth. You could artificially create uh, annual growth greater than two and a half, but you cannot legally pass any kind of a ballot measure that does that. So if, if, the, if the town wishes to have increases more than uh, over the first year, it would have to pass a series of overrides. The only thing I think of, and you can articulate this, <coughs> ten, oops, sorry. sorry, 10 years ago, we did have a different model in terms of um, the pressure on the operating, still, um, the pressure on the operating budget. We used to really cover a lot of capital kind of um, big projects under the operating budget. So Bob, I wonder if you could okay. speak to that, because yeah. that's been a radical shift since the last override, which has helped us a lot support the operating budget for the last, you know, 13, 15 years without an additional override. Um, that's a good point, Paul. 15 or so years ago when Barrows and Wood End were built and rebuilt, um, the then leaders of the town chose to fund most of that inside the Prop 2.5 levy. So I don't remember the combined cost. I'm sure it was more than 10 million. I seem to think that each school was around six to eight million. Um, that was 10 odd million dollars that could have been requested of the voters as a debt exclusion, much as this building was and the high school was. And the town would have had more running room, if you will. Um, but most of that debt is now paid off. So that's a past truth and accuracy of how it squeezed the operating budgets many years ago. But perversely, um, that helped us in the more recent years because we never got used to spending that higher amount of money that we otherwise might have had. Just a quick comment. So um, the one thing I, I would add to that is that there are other types of sources of revenue that can be there. Some of which are, are kind of legislated at, at state level, others have some local control. Um, the selectmen have been going through and looking at fees, as an example, and reviewing those to make sure that they're all appropriate. That's an additional source. Um, excise taxes we looked at. So everybody goes out and buys more new cars, that raises the excise tax, that's a bonus. Everybody who eats in town, especially folks from out of town as well as in town, that raises a little bit of revenue also. But in, in the scrubbing process that's taken place, there isn't any single or even combination of several sources of additional revenue that come close to addressing the need that we have, the size of the need that we have. It really, the, the override is the only mechanism to do that. And there's been a lot of scrubbing over many years. There's been exceptional scrubbing over this year, trying to figure out how to, how to get around that. Um, there's an indirect one possibly which we've been talking about, and that is the whole issue of state aid and the fact that it's dropped uh, so dramatically. And you know, it certainly wouldn't hurt to, to send a note to your friendly legislator and talk about that um, because it's having an impact on all their constituents. It's huge. Um, and I, if the discussion to lower the state income tax a little bit further passes, if that takes place, and that's going to make the situation even worse and put even more focus on local governments to take care of their, their own revenues. So that, that's kind of where we are. Oh, actually, I believe she was first. And first is the school committee in session? Yes. We are, okay. So mine's actually an education question. Um, when I, I'm learning more about state aid, and so uh, education aid that we get 
I know all of the state aid is lower than we had hoped and expected, but state aid for education is based in part on a committee, a community's ability to pay, is that right? And is, does state aid also for the town, um, the town side have that kind of limit? Is, it, is your community's wealth part of the formula in terms of how much money you get? And um, No. No, okay, thanks. And just to put an explanation point on that, according to the state, Reading has a very high ability to pay. Yes. The fact that it does not choose to pay is different than the ability to pay. Exactly. Thanks, Mr. Chair, Barry Berman, um, Selectman. I wanted to get back um, to this gentleman's question um, and just sort of talk about some of the things that you know, what can we do above two and a half? And, and it was alluded to about new growth. So we're allowed to increase um, our, our total tax levy by two and a half percent plus new growth. Um, and, that's a, and that's a really, really key piece. Um, and uh, we've studied this a lot against our, uh, compared to our peer communities, and Reading raises on average about $12 million, <coughs> excuse me, $12 million less per year in property taxes from the commercial and industrial sector. We're probably raising about the same amount of property taxes as most of our peer communities on residential, but we are probably dead last out of 25 in terms of what we're able to raise from the commercial and industrial base. So that's why the selectmen have, over the last few years, done things like creating 40R districts and really looking at targeting some economic development because that stuff you can, you can add dollar for dollar right into your, into your tax levy by the new growth. You know, you can raise your two and a half. Um, so um, we budget, uh, Bob budgets about, I think, correct me, $550,000 yeah. a year of new growth. The last three years we've been averaging a lot more than that, seven, eight, nine hundred thousand dollars of new growth, which is great. A lot of that's from some of the larger multifamily developments, the Pulte, um, Johnson Woods, etc. We also have 16 projects that are permitted or in the process of being permitted, some small, some large, um, that will add to that. But while that's great news, um, even if we were able to kind of one of the big bonanzas is if we ever um, are able um, to formulate a plan where we can move uh, the DVW garage and then have that land for economic development, at best, some of the some of the projections are is that might be two to three million dollars of new uh, you know growth per year, um, but look how far we are off from that. So while new growth is really important and um, we are focusing like a laser on doing that, mostly to relieve the pressure on having to do these overrides every year, they by themselves are not going to be a substitute for an override. What it will do, it will it will make the overrides going forward less severe and um, and less frequent because we'll have that new growth to sustain it. The problem is you can't count on it. A lot of those projects that are um, been permitted or we're working on, things can change. The economy can change, demand can change, developer capacity could change, they might not get financing. So you can't really count on it, but it's something that we are really hoping that we'll just sort of, once we can get over this sort of hurdle, then we won't have to keep coming back year after year you know, to keep deciding, you know, we're gonna fund, you know, a couple more pencils and, and, and you know, another firefighter. So um, it, it's really important, but I wanna be really, really clear on it. It's not a substitute for a proposition two and a half. It's just something that's gonna make it a little bit easier. Um, because I, I've heard discussion that people say, well, we don't need it. We're just growing, we're building all this stuff. You know, we'll just grow into it. That's not gonna be the case. So I just wanted to point that out. Thank you. If, if I can just add to that, because I've had this question a couple of times, so it might be on some of your minds. Um, the town has to be also very mindful of when it has new growth, what are the costs that those things are bringing to town? So if it brings a lot of school children, the tax revenues may not even pay for them. Um, if it brings a lot of um, seniors to town, it may or may not pay for them. We've done a lot of economic development work, uh, quite a lot of statistical work, and um, for the first time in the last couple of years, we've looked at some of the larger past projects to get an idea of how successful or not those have been. Now, it's easy to measure how many school children there are in a project. It's easy to talk to the police and the fire chief and get a sense of how busy different areas make them without actually measuring the actual cost. So it's, it's really difficult to do a dollar for dollar 
Um, but at the two extremes, um, near where I live, uh, the old farm that was uh, developed into multifamily housing uh, is at best a break-even financially for the town. And uh, the redevelopment down where the uh, Addison Book, uh, Addison Wesley Book Company, publishing company used to be, is a home run. Um, that's very profitable. The, the taxes we bring in exceed the costs that uh, both Dr. Doherty and I would have. So I, I agree totally with everything Barry said, and we're also trying to be a little smarter of recognizing when you bring revenues in, you also bring some costs. Uh, thank you, Jonathan Barnes. Um, Bob, I actually have one question and a comment uh, back to uh, Ms. Landry's um, question and your comment about the ability for town meeting to uh, more carefully or completely review the town side budget, but less ability to review the school side budget. I'm not necessarily, in fact, I'm not advocating um, that town meeting have that authority, but I am just curious. I've heard that several times, and I know there's been discussion. From where does that restriction um, derive, if I can state say? That's actually a state law. Okay, thank you. So that um, that all other towns in the area. Yeah, that's there. correct. Okay. Yes. And then um, my my comment, um, and again, I know it's it's not an answer in terms of generating revenue, but. Um, it is at least something that in in our history it doesn't appear that we that the town um, has taken advantage of but there are other opportunities to enhance revenue that this town has not um, seen fit to do and I just want to suggest that going forward um, we think about it as another alternative uh, there was, and none of these are probably available any longer, but there was uh, revenue available under the Community Preservation Act, um, and uh, that might have been an opportunity that the town could have uh, at least captured some revenue um, had we pushed that a little further, and I know it came up, and I know Tom Media rejected it, but it's, it's an opportunity to generate uh, revenue, and similarly, um, at the time there was the, the increase in the sales tax, there was an opportunity for local towns um, to enhance their revenue by increasing uh, a local tax on restaurants and, and other businesses. <coughs> Again, uh, the town, um, did they do that? Okay, good. Um, and lastly, there was, as we all know, um, the opportunity to capture some revenue with respect to the uh, manufacturing um, of, uh, of marijuana, um, which I know I, I, I just saw on the news. I think it's either Andover or North Andover. Um, is going to be uh, developing a very large site which will be bringing in a large sum of money. I, I know all of these have come up and the town has rejected them, but um, I just want to mention it that as we look to sources of revenue, um, the answers aren't only uh, expanding commercial uh, development uh, or proposition to overrides, uh, two and a half overrides. There, there are a lot other opportunities and we should consider every one of them and advocate every one of them. Um, Jonathan, you'd be glad to know we're the only community in Massachusetts that has a hotel tax without a hotel. <laughs> we're ready. <laughs> We've had that for like 15 years. Hi, Todd Merkel, Sanborn Lane. Uh, I really just would like to uh, read a statement, which uh, since we have all five, I believe, members of the Board of Selectmen in attendance tonight is really directed uh, at them uh, to the extent that any of these observations uh, can be addressed uh, by anyone uh, that would be welcome. So there's a perception in this town, uh, right there wrongly, that the Board of Selectmen is divided. Um, there are certain members of the board that understand that an override is the only structural solution to the financial predicament that we find ourselves in. And these selectmen are willing to not only vote to put an override on the ballot, but to also get out into the community, educate voters, and proactively advocate for its passage. On the other hand, the perception is that there are some members on the board of selectmen that may vote to put the override on the ballot, but they do so only reluctantly and will be inclined to support only the smallest possible number. What the citizens of Reading need right now is leadership. If there's an alternative structural solution to this problem, please stand up and present what that is. 
After sitting through all of the town budget and school committee meetings over the last several weeks, I have yet to hear one. We have a structural problem. It has nothing to do with the high school litigation. It has nothing to do with the building that we're sitting in right now. It is a structural problem. It's a function of all of these numbers and the fact that we have health care insurance growing faster than 3%. We have unfunded or partially funded mandates growing faster than 3%. We have state aid declining and we have a cap on revenue growth. It's math, okay? Yeah. If there are more cuts that you believe need to be made to the schools or the town's budget, please stand up and specify where those cuts should be made. If the balanced budgets presented by the town and the schools over the past couple of weeks rep represent adequate funding levels in your minds, then please make your positions clear on that. With respect to over override sizing, it is my personal opinion that there's a fear factor that's likely to be reflected in the Board of Selectmen del deliberations that are set to take place next Tuesday, January 30th. It's a fear of getting your hand slapped again by the voters on April 3rd. Again, what we, what we need right now is leadership. Regardless of who you consider to be your core constituents, Reading's voters need to understand that this problem is simply not going away without an override. Going for the smallest possible number and then crossing your fingers to Barry's point, crossing your fingers that new growth is gonna make this problem go away is not leadership in my mind. We already know that the aggregate of 4.7 million that has been requested on a combined basis between the, between the town and the schools does not have long-term sustainability built into it. It may have some short-term sustainability, but not long-term sustainability. That's three million for the schools, 1.7 million for the town. We know that that number will not last without praying for new growth to save us. Any further reduction of this number is short-sighted and it's likely to land us right back in the same spot a few years from now. Right around the same time that you may have to go back to voters to fund Killam, to fund the high school athletic fields, for the DPW, or various other debt exclusions. One of the criticisms that I've heard about why we're here today is that this building that we're sitting up in was voted on several years ago. Rightly or wrongly, what I hear is that there was not enough forward thinking about when we were gonna be in this position when we would need an operating override. So right now we're sitting here and we know that there are debt exclusions that we're gonna need our voters to vote on in a few years. So I'd like to make the point to the selectmen that we should not be short-sighted and vote for a number that's so small because we're gonna feel comfortable that it may have a better chance of getting approved by voters and then we get criti you get criticized a few years from now because we're sitting right back here all again and all over again and dealing with this exact same issue. So as you formulate your thoughts over the coming days in advance of the 30th, please do not simply look for the easiest path forward. Please lead this town where it needs to go and support the full $4.7 million override. Thank you. To, um, to Mark's point, uh, to Mark's point about contacting your legislators, I certainly would recommend that people do so, but I don't think we're going to see any kind of windfall of state aid, particularly when Reading, as, as um, Bob mentioned, is considered um, a community that has great ability to pay, even if we don't pay. Um, you know, if this, like, like the town, the state also has scarce resources and they're probably not going to be putting more towards a community that state when they look at, you know, the 351 sure cities and towns right. across the Commonwealth, they're not going to prioritize um, more highly the communities that are viewed um, in their community wealth model under the Chapter 70 school funding formula to have a greater ability to pay. But, but still contact your legislators. <laughs> Um, I can't really speak for the Board of Selectmen. I um, go to their meetings, but I uh, don't have any right to speak for them. Um, but I think their biggest concern is 
what happens if the number doesn't get passed? Not that they'll get slapped on the wrist for asking too much, but um, we asked for more than the voters wanted to provide us last year, and now we're another year behind in our override process. If we go through that again, we'll be two years behind, and uh, <coughs> it gets more and more difficult to catch up. So um, again, it's, it's not that uh, people are worried that um, you know, they'll get slapped around or whatever for asking too much. It's it's the fear of what happens, you know, how far back do we go if it doesn't get passed. So. And I just wanted to make one comment um, regarding when we decided to renovate this library. We did know it was coming down the pike. Um, and you try so hard to get that kind of word out there. You know, you have the meetings, but as you can see, even tonight, it's not a tremendous amount of people for what we're looking to do in the next few months. So I just encourage you, talk to your neighbors. That's how people get educated in this town, is just talking to your friends, talking to your neighbors, getting people aware. Um, because we did know what was coming down the pike with the library. And oh, by the way, the library vote to renovate this beautiful building was overwhelming the most positive you know vote we've had in this town it was hugely supported in the community and for good reason it's a beautiful building um, so mostly it's just a plea to really go out and talk to your friends and family and whoever else you know in town to get the word out Get you next, Andy. Jennifer Hillary, High Street. Um, thank you, Paula, for your thoughts about um, the need for citizens to go out and talk to their neighbors. And thank you, Todd, because you brought up a point that I also wanted to bring up tonight. I'm, I'm stating the obvious when I say that everyone in this room may have a slightly different view of what our school and town priorities should be, whether it be as broad as helping our seniors, our students, our library, or our public safety departments or as specific as cuts to athletics versus foreign language. But rather than focus on these differences of opinions, I want to suggest we have a common goal, preserving the town we love and the benefits we all enjoy. And in order to do this, we need to unite against our common enemy, as Todd mentioned, and that is the structural problem of Proposition 2 and a half. It's been stated before, and uh, Mr. Lidecker, I think you did a wonderful introduction about this, this structural problem. Um, we are not alone in looking for a solution to our financial woes by seeking an override. We look at communities such as Belmont, Ipswich, Shrewsbury, to name a few that have passed successful overrides in the past several years. But it becomes our job as citizens, after we see the leadership from the Board of Selectmen in this upcoming week, to take the torch and to carry it over the finish line so that as Reading enters its, I believe, 375th anniversary this um, year, it continues to thrive and be a community we are proud of. But the only way we're going to carry that proverbial torch over the finish line is to start working together, to start talking to our neighbors, to put our differences opinion inside, and use this common ground to move forward. The residents of Reading are, are given a very unique opportunity in April to shape our financial future. And um, this is the second time we've been given this opportunity in less than two years, which I am very grateful for. And I hope that we uh, recognize this opportunity and say that five years of level service cuts is enough by voting on what hopefully is the override put on the ballot in the upcoming weeks. So I hope that residents in this room start introducing themselves and really working towards defeating this common enemy. Thank you. Hi, Andy Friedman, member of the uh, select board. Um, just to uh, respond to the last couple com comments, uh, one is one is a comment and one is a, a question to FinCom, the town manager and superintendent. Um, it, of course, the, the 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 trick in all this is addressing the structural deficit with an override that is likely to pass. Divining the, the number that will pass 
is a, is a bit like going after water with a, a divining rod. It's, it's not a great science. And, and um, so, and I, and I think we can ask questions like we did in our survey about sort of gauging what tolerance people have for an override amount. But as Andrew Grimes said at one of our meetings in December, um, that's sort of, I think, I'm an, I might not get it exactly right, but he said, how much do you want to pay for a new washing machine? Uh, $50, $100, or 150 People will say 50 and then they show you what you can get for 50 150 200 300 And people's choice will change. That is, um, if people see what they're getting for a certain override, I think there'll be a higher tolerance. Anyway, it's a, it's an art, not a science. So that's what we're going to be struggling with. My my question um, comes off of what Todd Todd mentioned about sustainability. And are we going to have a chance to hear from FinCom and Superintendent Town Manager? I know you guys have touched on it already. Um, that is, the superintendent put uh, together a I mean, it's wrong. A reconstruction. Reconstruct, reconstruction budget. And Bob put together um, a list of uh, not asks, that's not a good one. Priorities. Priority list. And if, if those were to be funded, if, if the override was that amount, and they were to be funded, I know it's hard to predict, but what kind of legs would something like that have? I know it's you worked <laughs> some <laughs> cushion into it, but point. how many years out might you expect it to last? Given that we're going to have some economic, um, yeah. So do you understand? Yes. Yeah, I'll, I'll start. I, I answered for John last night, so I'll try again. <laughs> okay. Tonight he can correct me. Um, we both looked at the budgets with an idea of not just the first year, uh, but going at least two or three years deep. Um, so we've devised a budget model, and the selectmen will see on the 30th and discuss on the 30th what that looks like um, to make sure not just positions are funded, but other costs that would be related to those positions, even the sneaky 5% on capital. So if we're going to spend a million dollars, we have to also add 5% in capital. Otherwise, the FinCom policy is not going to work. So I think three years is the best best we can hope for with certainty. Um, and the other thing that, uh, that John said that I agree with is um, once the number is set, we'll both look at it, and we'll both want to make sure that there is some, some portion of the first year that's built in that could be flexible in the future years. In other words, if it was a, a million dollars and there were 20 employees and that's it, I would be pretty uncomfortable with that. If there's a mix of expenses that I could cut back in the future in order to not cut back on the employees, then I know I would prefer to do that mix. So we are so used to building defensive budgets that will be cut in the future that it's, it's almost second nature to us. Um, it's harder to prove that we do it other than we're so used to it, though. Two, two pieces. Um, one, I just want to talk a little bit more about what Bob said. So in the reconstruction budget that we put forward to the, the school committee, um, and they did support that that amount um, on Monday night also. Uh, as Bob said, we, we also put in a number of expenses, things that we know that we could over in years two and three reduce that amount so that we can continue to support the, the personnel pieces. Um, the second piece, which I think is very important, we, when we put together this reconstruction budget, there was a lot of thought um, and how we wanted to take a look at things differently and be more proactive instead of reactive. So the reconstruction budget as a whole reinvests in the regular education portion of our budget, um, which is the area that we have had to cut over the last few years. When you invest in strong curriculum and instruction, it has an, a positive effect on the, well, it has a decrease effect on the number of special education referrals. 
And that, that's the premise of why we wanted to put to that new vision, that reconstruction, but we've started doing, but we just haven't had the resources to fully implement it. So that is going to also help with sustainability. If I, if I might, I also want to address a question that I just heard um, a moment ago. I wasn't sure if I could find the slide, but this, this information is dated now. It's uh, 18, 18 months old, uh, but we brought this out uh, at that point. And these are our 25 statistical peer communities. Um, they have the same form of government as we do, um, and they're otherwise judged by two different consultants in two different times to be statistically similar in ability to pay and so on. They are sorted by a column that says residential percent, which is right here. Milton, where I grew up, is 96% residential. Reading is 91% residential. On the low end, no surprise, Burlington is 62% residential. When I first put this together, I, I was really, really quite surprised. The communities highlighted in yellow were the ones that have asked and passed, and asked and or passed an override since Reading had last asked. When you have a high residential tax base, by definition, you have most likely more students and most likely more costs than a Burlington would have. You must ask for overrides of Prop 2.5 when you are built this way more often than if you're built with as some of these communities are. And, and one of the advantages that some of these communities also have is vacant land so that they can add to the commercial base. Reading does not have vacant land. North Reading does, as an example. Wilmington does, although they're already pretty heavily uh, commercial. But I think it's important, this adds to the structural element. This is why it is, what we're seeing is not at all unusual. It's totally expected. We, we could have predicted this and did 10 years ago. Uh, until you actually see the budgets that lay people off, it's hard to tell someone what's going to happen and have them fully believe you. But this is no surprise. Yep. <clears throat> Hi, um, my name is Michelle Sanfi, and I'm 75 Glenview Circle. So I was at the Board of Selectmen meeting last night, and I just want to make, see if I'm making the connection correctly. So last night, Bob, I heard you talk about a five million is the top, and that was a 1.4 million municipal and 2.55 million schools, and then the benefits and the capital that were added into that. So that was about the five million. And then reflecting back on what Mr. Merkel was talking about, that 4.7, are those related, like, I know they're not the same number, but I'm saying, am I making the correct connection? Um, what you just <coughs> cited from last night is my best understanding right now. I'm not sure how we got his four points, but it is awfully close. Okay. Um, so I guess in light of um, what the Board of Selectmen are tasked to do on the 30th and the concern of what the appetite is for the community and the concern, deep concern, if an override does not pass and where we'll be at. Um, we also have the other concern that if our, our number is too low, we don't really have sustainability because the five million, what I'm understanding, has only built in sustainability for a couple of years. So that could put us back in this position a lot quicker so um, as somebody who I think a lot of people in this room know has been advocating for an override, did in 2016 and is again now, um, I don't want to be back in that position. It's a lot of work. Um, a perception I think that is out there that I want to address is that we are a committee that is made up of parents that are only concerned about the schools. And I will say that we are mainly a committee that is made up of parents. The majority of people in our committee do have children in the schools. And I think that's where we became very impassioned about this. Um, where I think there is a misperception is that 
we are not only concerned about our schools. We've been to all the Board of Selectmen meetings. We are very concerned about the municipal side. We're very concerned about public safety. We're very concerned. Um, I had the opportunity to listen to Mrs. Angstrom talk about her position and about the risk and about what she needs. And I think that, that that's a town concern. And so all the divide that you know people are experiencing and expressing in different ways, I would just really like to reiterate what Mrs. Hillary said much more eloquently. It, this is time for us to put our differences aside. This is our town. This is everybody's future, not just our children's future. People want to stay here a, 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 until they die. And they should, you know, think about that. And also, property values have increased tremendously. And we are going to be in a difficult situation if our pro property values start to decline, where there's a direct correlation between that and the schools. Um, because then, you know, your nest egg is going to get whittled away at. And then what do we become? What kind of writing are we? I, I just want to address one of those points, um, at least from the town side. Um, whatever number is put forward and whatever number should pass, um, in my mind, on the town side, has nothing to do with the sustainability question. It has to do with how many resources do we have. Um, if less are asked for and less are received than what I've asked for for the total, I'm not about to take more risk and jeopardize what has been given by the taxpayers. So from a risk standpoint and a sustainability standpoint, I would look at any amount gratefully and carefully. George. Oh, sorry. Uh, George, uh, George Katchen, 66 Colburn Road. Okay, I have to follow up Michelle's comment. Um, yes, I am a member of the Yes for Reading <coughs> Committee. I am a senior. Never had kids in the school system here. Been here, as I mentioned before, 29 years, almost 29 years. Was that the 350th celebration? And so within the last uh, whatever period, two since years. you emailed me in September, I've been involved in uh, supporting the override. And I'm doing that for all the reasons that have been stated, but also because, I mean, I believe in writing. I believe in the comments on house values. And I believe in a good society. I believe in a good town. Education is so important and so fundamental. Public safety is so important and fundamental. We need both. We need those for a safe society, a safe town, and as we grow. And so I would urge the selectmen, uh, John, Barry, Andy, Dan, John, to vigorously do as other speakers said, vote for the amounts that we need to do the job. I heard those kids and teachers speak. I heard the kids, they were scared of what could happen. I think it's important, not only for them, but for us. Whether you have kids or not, for us. I mean, we're proud of this community. I mean, I moved here because people like Susan Theophanis and Sandy Drainer way back in uh, 1989 were friends of mine and they said, come here, this is a great town. And I really do believe in it, and I think we need to sustain it. Thank you. Can I just say ditto? <laughs> I'm Linda Snow Doxer. I'm a citizen and a school committee member. Um, I say citizen first because we have a lot of people in this town with very different needs. And I was really impressed last year with the work the selectmen did to do the senior, um, senior tax relief work. And one of my questions is whether that senior tax relief program is going to continue, whether there's been anything learned about whether those numbers can be increased, 
and also how are we going to get that information out with a vengeance so that as many seniors as we can reach will know about that because I think the concerns are very real um, in terms of the tax increases I don't think that changes whether our town needs them or not um, for everybody's benefit as um, Mr. Katchen just said but if there are ways for us to help offset the, the pain of our increases for all of our citizens I'm just hoping that there are some answers there too thank you um, if I might just explain to anyone that that doesn't know what it is um, Reading um, within the past year or so has become the third community in the state to pass specific uh, home rule petition to relieve senior taxpayers of the burden of property taxes when they have such low income. Um, we've done such an interesting and a good job that um, Beacon Hill um, is actually looking at it as a model to roll out for the state. But in the meanwhile, um, we have only been approved to do it for three years. We believe if Beacon Hill does nothing, we would be extended another three years. It's, it's typical to get tax policies in three-year clumps, so I think we'll be able to do that. Um, but just to be clear, um, the tax uh, burden that the seniors are not paying are paid by all the rest of us. This is not a loss of revenue. We were in no position to do that. The, um, the lost revenue, if you will, was shared by the commercial sector as well as the residential sector. It was a shift. Um, I don't remember the figures, but I do remember um, there was an upward benefit of $2,000 uh, for senior paying 6000 or 7000 in property taxes with very little income. That's a significant number. Um, we did as much marketing as we could. Um, I'm quite sure that the, uh, the best marketing is the first year when your neighbor had it and you didn't. So we expect more next year. Um, but our assessor, who we share with Wakefield because we can't afford a full-time one, um, went to every senior event you could think of. <laughs> he went to the senior center several times. He did a pretty good job. Um, but as, as, as always, communication with any group of people is very difficult. So we do think word of mouth uh, will succeed. I, I would say from my personal standpoint, I saw less applications than I anticipated, but I have no real way to know the exact financial condition of specific people. So I don't know how many people we missed. I assume there were some, though. Uh, for, for John and Bob, um, there have been some numbers thrown around, like a 4.7, a 5.0, some different numbers. Um, I'm wondering if you guys can put up in this forum where everyone's here, where those numbers come from. In other words, what's the uh, the reconstruction budget, as well as what is the uh, the list that the, the town uh, uh, department has provided? Yeah, Two, four, three, six. I can speak. Um, I'll go first, and then John could be more detailed. Schools are roughly two and a half million, a little less. Town is roughly one and a half million. Um, the benefits cost of those portions would be about 800000 <coughs> and then capital would be 200000 So that's how you build up to the $5 million number. The uh, number that the school committee voted the other evening on the reconstruction override budget was $2,436,000. Do you gentlemen have the slides that would show what's involved in those numbers? Um, again, to John's number, the closest I can come is what was cut out of the budget, and it's not a precise number. There's that million four seventy. Um, I remember adding two things into the override list, if you will, that were not technically cut, which is why it's a little closer to one and a half million. I get, all I'm, I'm asking for what was shared at the school committee meeting um, and the public hearing as it relates to the reconstruction and the same thing that was shared with the Board of Selectmen in, in the past. Not, not Nothing new, just the, the old existing documents. Do those exist? I, I don't know what he means. I, I could that? share it verbally. I, I don't have the mark. I don't think you... We were prepared to present that tonight. That was uh, actually, we were. That was discussed. But the 
the, the budget, the reconstruction budget? Yeah, it's, so my understanding is that's exactly what was going to get shown now. There would be a slide on the balanced budget and a slide on the reconstruction budget. And the same thing on the town side. I mean, we talked the numbers. I just thought it would be helpful for, for people here and on TV to actually see what's involved. Are they, are they online? Can we pull them up? Yeah. No, I don't think that, that one, I don't think the revised one's online. I could do it verbally. Let me start with that. Okay. So, um, the, the total amount was put together um, through a combination of things, as I mentioned, and we, we spent probably three, three meetings overall talking about um, how we came together with the different areas of the, of the, of the reconstruction budget. So a piece of it is uh, retaining staff that would be lost through a balanced budget for next year, which would include the seven middle school teachers and the three elementary teachers. Um, in addition, we have made uh, teacher reductions at the high school, both this year and last year. Um, the reconstruction budget has six high school teachers. Uh, in addition, for expenses, and these are things that have been, over the years, been reduced um, in order to make less personnel cuts. Uh, we have computer replacement. We have teacher training. We also have um, in earmarked each year curriculum cycle renewal, which for the last two years, town meeting has supported the science. Next year would be the third year of science, which is not in the balanced budget, but is in the reconstruction budget. But moving forward, it would be a way to earmark funding for curriculum purchases because the curriculum's always getting uh, changed and renewed based on changes that happen at the state level with the frameworks. And there are areas coming down the road that, um, that, are, that the state is about to um, approve for frameworks, most notably social studies, computer science. In addition, we also have, um, and this is in the balanced, uh, the, uh, the balanced budget is restoring the athletics, restoring an elementary tutor, and restoring the vacation cleaning. Those were all cuts that would that are for next year. A computer technician, which was cut out of this year's budget. Um, clerical support. It, um, both in HR, HR, HR slash payroll. And then the curriculum leadership positions, some of it are new positions, some of it are caused by restructuring. So the two new positions are K-8 to curriculum coordinators, which allow for vertical um, alignment of our curriculum. These would be supervisory positions of teachers as well. We also are restructuring current team chairs at the elementary level, it adding 2.4 more team chairs, which would be in this budget to have a combination assistant principal team chair at each elementary school. And we went into great detail in all of this in the meetings. And then the last piece would be to have an assistant special education director slash rise preschool director. And on the town side, Mark, if you're referring to a list I shared with the selectmen of 30 things prioritized, I don't have that with me. Um, I could get down to at least 10 by memory pretty accurately. Beyond that, I couldn't. Um, nine of the top 10 were the public safety positions I mentioned, and the 10th was uh, help for poor Sharon. Um, any town of our size, even without a light department, uh, has an assistant town accountant. We don't. Um, it may not be well understood by the town, uh, but Sharon and I, by charter, must look through every invoice of the schools and the light department. She actually does that, and I rely on her because I can't. Um, those are the top ten, without any question in my mind. But then, as you can see from this list of what was cut, there's a variety of expenses and wages throughout the other departments. Thanks. I, I wasn't meaning to just kind of put you on the spot on purpose. I think I was trying to circle back to Eric's point in the beginning that we've outlined the need based on specific cuts that have taken place or areas where we're not up to par in areas like public safety. 
that are required to bring us to those levels. And those numbers, when they come together, represent about $5 million. Those are the numbers. And the point in trying to show them was just that quite a process has been gone through to develop those, to show what that need is. And there were a lot of folks who made the point earlier that they're all needs. It's not really a list of, well, you know, maybe we can do without this, maybe we can do without that. That's what we've been doing for the last five years. It's precisely what we've been doing. <coughs> 15 years even. <coughs> there, at some point, we need to recognize kind of where we are and what we need to do. For the last, I can speak for the last four years at town meeting, this topic has been brought up specifically by the chairs of FinCom that we will need an override, that we cannot sustain what we're doing. And I guess I want to just make sure people understand that the notion of, let's say we, we do nothing, we defeat the override. You cannot have the same level of services going forward. You, that, the option of not passing the override means accepting cuts in services every single year going forward. We've done it. We've perhaps been negligent in not telling everything what, what the impacts are going to be because we've done such a great job of managing under that. But the burden is too high. There isn't more room. The budgets have been scrubbed. We're going to go through them again, but all of, every member of FinCom, um, we've been at, attending these meetings. It's not like there's a, this little bucket over here that we can grab. There's no bucket, no, or, or I could say the bucket's empty. It, it, it's done. Thank you. Those are the key words. Thank you. So before I make this comment, I want to be clear that this is a I am going to reflect views that I have heard from some of my neighbors that I feel like sort of an editorial comment, like the, the, the views expressed are not necessarily <laughs> those of <laughs> um, But one of the views that I hear is I don't trust that, that they, meaning town government, you know, the great gray they, are handling our money well, and so why would I want to give them more? I would welcome a response to that so that I can respond to my friends and neighbors. Um, what, what would you say to that? We're not the federal government. We don't shut down. <laughs> <laughs> if, if you were to ask our 24 peer communities what is a well-run uh, town, Reading would be in the top two or three of every single one of those towns' answers. That's the real answer, is peer respect. Uh, if I may, I was at a PTO meeting at Birch Meadow last week, and that question came up, and I was presenting to the PTO, and they asked me what was my opinion of the financial situation and how it was run. Um, and as we were discussing it, someone else in the group said, well, we haven't had an override in 15 years. There's your answer. We've been doing, they've been doing a fantastic job. Haven't had to have an override in years. We've been able to maintain a level service, granted with pain, but we've been able to be maintained. One thing I would just say to someone who claims that our government is not well run, I would just say, well, Wall Street has given us a AAA rating. And those are people that have no skin in the game. They're not on the Reading rant. They're not on any Facebook page. They're folks who just basically look at the books. And they said, well, Reading, you're doing a great job. And by the way, when we go to sell debt for this building uh, and for the high school and for eventually uh, for, for Pelham, that's going to be at a much lower interest rate than any of the towns around here who don't have a AAA bond rating. So um, that stands for itself, I guess. And we also sell at a better rate than the federal government does. Well, that's easy. <laughs> <laughs> it's becoming easier. <laughs> so, Elaine Webb, uh, 309 Pearl Street, I'm on the school committee, I'm obviously a resident. Uh, for our children through the Reading Public Schools, myself a graduate in 1981. Um, I have maybe not bring my yearbook, but in the yearbook, there's a summary of our four years. And there is a statement I told Dr. Darius today, there's a statement that says, disappointing November elections, 
Reagan's in the White House, and pound sign, number sign, exclamation, ampersign, two and a half, prop two and a half passed. What were, what were 17 year olds thinking at the time? Putting that in their yearbook? You know what we were thinking? We were thinking how much we loved the Redden Public Schools. There was a fine and industrial arts program. There were all kinds of shops. There were all kinds of equivalent of maker spaces. When's the last time we talked about maker spaces, John? Three years ago, four years ago? So even then, we knew as Todd and the last neighbor said, it's not sustainable. So when people talk about government, you know, maybe when we're thinking about Washington and we're being aggravated or watching the latest Colbert to try to figure out what's going on, you can think about people you don't know. But the government, there's all the people in this room. There are people who went to high school here, are raising families, been here for generations. There are people who are new, came here because they loved it. So the government is us, people that care deeply. I think if you look at the schools, I mean, you could highlight certain data, people up certain data. Um, but another financial data, uh, Sharon and Gail participate in audits. All those, we have stellar results of our financial audits. So, you know, that's a piece of data. When you look at the per pupil, right, where Reading is, you can find the numbers. We're seventh out of the 13 peer communities. We're way in the bottom out of the state. Um, we're $2,200, sorry, oh, we're, um, sorry, we are, yeah, $2,000 below the average. Interestingly, if uh, we used to look at, um, Pat Scatini had a thing that he would say, what would it take for us to be average? You know, what if Reading were investing in its schools to the state average? You know what, it, it's about $2.1 million right now. So we've put together a reconstruction budget, right, that says these are the things that we need. We've built in sustainability. We've been doing without them for years. We need to do this. So hope that's a couple data points um, and really appreciate there's so many people who have been like with us at every meeting and I really, really appreciate it. I just take a minute to highlight all the staff. Um, the town and the staff who have spent countless hours with all of us. So keep talking. I didn't feel like shouting this time. Uh, Eric Burkhart, um, Belmont Street, member of FinCom. So to respond also to the, the viewpoint, the default position of many is not to trust government. And I've been involved with FinCom and on town meeting for a couple of years now, but before that I was clueless <laughs> in many ways about government. And that might have been my default position. Um, so I understand the, the question. Um, and you can hear the town manager defend um, the, the rigor and, 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 the, and the hard work. And the cynic might say, well, his salary depends on that. And you can hear a selectman stand up and, and, and offer a defense, and you might, the cynic might say, well, the person's re-election depends on that. Our salary does too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's where I was going, Dan. <laughs> and I, I mean, understand that, that cynicism. So maybe I'd encourage you to look to FinCom. Uh, we're appointed, we're volunteers, we have no salary like the selectmen. Um, so um, we have been through all the numbers uh, in detail. We did it last year, we know it thoroughly. Um, and I don't want to speak for my fellow um, uh, colleagues on the, on the FinCom, but I think we would all stand squarely behind Mark's comments. Um, it is what it is, it's done. We, we, we believe that the town is very well run. Um, we believe that extraordinary effort has gone in to managing these budgets, and we believe that this is a legitimate and dire situation. And again, I don't want to speak for my colleagues, but we are happy to talk to anybody in detail in the town who would like to talk to us about, uh, about this and those questions. They have the right people. 
Any other comments or questions? Just, just to pick you. But <coughs> to pick you back a little bit on that point, I've been on FinCom for four years, and um, I feel very good about um, you know the state of our reserves in accordance with FinCom policy, our our bond rating, the management and running of the town, and the um, the care with which. Um, budgets are created and delivered and combed over for every possible area of savings and we're way past that now where where we're, we're facing such pain with um, with with this um, attempt at a balanced budget that um, we're more my level of discomfort uh, falls is is in the inability of these budgets to serve the community adequately and that is where I feel uncomfortable not when it comes to looking at how the town is run okay if that's it I want to thank everybody for coming tonight up oh, one more comment uh, Nick Borden, the uh, same lane member of the school committee. Uh, first of all, I want to thank all of you. Um, there are many volunteers in this room who spend an awful lot of their time, the discretionary time, to to your point, to really because they want to do what's right for our town. Uh, we, we have different views on that. Sometimes we have different uh, approaches, but everybody is extremely hardworking in, in town government, without exception. Then that uh, people want to get the answer right for uh, the rest of the town, um, for themselves, for their communities. Um, you know, we, I, I, I will say publicly, and I've said it before, it's, it's essential, I believe, personally, that we pass an override this year. I think it's important. Um, we're in a process. We need to participate in that process fully. We need to hear all the voices and stakeholders. We need to get uh, the number right, and we need to um, understand what the sustainability component should look like for our town, and, and we need to move forward together and, and really realize that at the end of this, we're all going to see each other at Little League and at community events and at the market basket and stop and shop or wherever we shop. And we all need to still be friends. So thank you all. John? Good evening, John Arena, Chair Board of Selectmen. I too want to thank uh, members of FinCon, our uh, executive staff, Bob. John, uh, those watching on TV, those behind me. Sorry, I don't mean to turn my back, school committee. Um, to amplify what Nick said, I believe that uh, we all have the duty to do what we think is best. I think there's far more that unites us than what divides us. Uh, we're all residents in this town. We all want to see it grow. Uh, truth lies somewhere in the conversation and the conversation is what we want to have. Um, I know passions are running hot. Um, I don't think there's any lack of will on the part of any member of the board I sit on. I'll speak for myself in any case. Um, I was one of the members that voted a seven and a half million dollar override last year. And I think that speaks for itself. Um, we do have to look at each other in the mirror when we get home. We have to look at our neighbors at the market basket or uh, Pample Moose or whatever when we're running errands. And to me, we're far better working together than we are arguing. Um, what troubles me sometimes is the energy that's put into emotion and the energy that's put into what I'll call um, just outright anger. Uh, I think that energy is far better directed trying to find a common solution. And I'm committed to find that. Uh, I look forward to our meeting on Tuesday night. Um, I suspect we'll be well attended. And uh, I, again, I look forward to uh, ending that evening with a satisfactory solution that we can all be happy with and that gets us to a successful outcome. Thank you.
Okay, try again. <laughs> um, well, if there are no further uh, comments or questions, um, I'm going to recess the uh, Finance Committee meeting and adjourn the forum. Um, and I do want to thank everybody for coming tonight. And, uh, I appreciate all your comments. I'm not going to. I have to have a beer.
it's a, I don't know if it's happening, right? Yeah. 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 They cut athletics, and we saw this in our We saw this in our GPA. We saw it in any kind of form. There should be something more than they Because of the revolving funds and payments, however, you don't get dollar for dollar the same benefit of a cut from the athletic part as you do from. Uh, well, that's a sad part. You could get rid of 100% of the athletics and still not cover the teachers. And that's how we do it. Not all the teachers. Right. You're thinking you, you probably get just the most school. of the middle school teachers. Right. But I mean, all the teachers. All the teachers. But just the nursing it was it was kind of yeah. a hot topic because of the yeah. as much defense of the yeah. So I'll give this input to Dr. Dorn. The other thing is the year that um, he went back to was 2014 or whatever, and they used an additional amount from the revolving fund to support the athletic budget that year, which made it somewhat artificially low. So it's not a 50% increase, it's less. But, yeah. Anything else? So for, for our discussion, just for a second, the last couple of years, we have been asked to and voted for an increment out of free cash to support the science program. We're not being asked to do that this year. Instead, it's in the reconstruction budget. And I don't know if that's something that we're going to talk about or we can leave it alone. Yeah, I was going to say leave it alone. One of the reasons it's doing is because it's not just going to be the science program, it's going to be the science curriculum. It's really going to be a recurring budget item. It's no longer a special one time. Right. right. My, my, um, I appreciate the approach that's being taken. My one fear is that. Let's suppose an overhead doesn't pass. Are there going to be things that need to really get adjusted that just have to, have to, have to? Because now I was going the same place and I'd say even stronger when it doesn't pass. Oh, I, just, I know, and I, and I hope that's not true. I know, but it's not a, yeah, I'm with it's you, but it's, it's, not, it's not the field. Yeah, nothing's a force. Right. And I'm extremely concerned. Right? And so what is the and my mom was like, right. There's a certain aspect of the cash. There's going to be a bit of pressure. They will not be Yes. Yes. You're above 7%. You said 7%. You're at 10. You're at 10. There's no money in there. It's just something to make. I know. The more I listen to people. <laughs> I'm not thinking of it out of fear. I'm, I'm thinking of it as a way to make sure that we are gauging each scenario realistically. Right, because we did talk about it would be important regardless for us to have a meeting between the election and the town meeting. Yeah, I think that's the right way to do it. Yeah. That's only 10 days between. And I was like, oh, I was telling her. Lights and burning armor. Yeah. Don't put that in the house. <laughs> He's angry. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. Oh, I'm By the way, I'm not going to be able to get my own. But grow up. Thanks for that. So anything else for the school presentation that we want? You know what would be helpful to me is to uh, do a real walk through the involvement funds. Yeah, I should talk about doing that over, over the last summer. <laughs> yeah, I think it'd be good for us to get a walk through. Yeah, I think it'd be helpful. Just, yeah. yeah. Just, you know, what are the adjustments? Why? Where are the balances? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, maybe we should invite her down I'm sure she'd love I just, to come. But I, I wonder if this is the way to do it. Uh, well, 
needs to be Yale too. I'm not sure. Oh yeah, also. because we did talk about doing that for right now. Yeah. Well, I think it's important before we finalize the budget. The recommendation. Our recommendation. Our recommendation. I think they have a lot of the stuff there. I'm not sure it's a heavy lift for them. So you said walk through the offsets? The offsets and the balances. And, and where their targets are. In other words, they've been targeting adjustments. Taking a bunch of them down. Oh, yeah. Three million I know, I told him it was going to be short meeting. Except for me. I do have a request for the, for the town side. The FTE numbers, just all four FTE numbers. Yeah, I think that actually historical I mean, uh, to at least five years because we're talking about again presented as early points. Yeah, I think at least five years. And actually two years are already presented, so it's only going back three. You are not talking about John. I'm now talking about Bob. Five years of ship higher. Right now it's two years of prior. So back years. Yeah. 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 Hopefully at the end without the uh, point. You're coming, right? Oh my God! That's just so easy to believe. You're right. It was. Three of us have to do the joint on his right hand. Oh, okay. So we don't meet again until like the seventh. Yeah. No, you don't. Thank you. So, get that. Yeah. No, I'm looking for it. Like,